thank you so much for joining us today and letting us into your space. Mm -hmm. We want to let you know that we have a lot of summer events coming up at Christ Community, and we would love to have you be a part of them. We also have groups that you can check out. So head on over to cccgreeley.org and take a look at everything that we can yeah. offer you. Um, also, we encourage you to like and subscribe yes. today. That way, when we have more content coming out, you get to see it. And we encourage you to like and subscribe uh, if you're listening on the podcast yeah. today. So that way, again, you know when we have new, fresh content. Yep. We hope you enjoy the message. Hello. Um, it's good to see you all. It's really good to be here. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to have a very fun time today as our, our family explores Psalm 139. Um, out front before coming in, I saw someone who I haven't seen forever. And I, I was vulnerable. I opened up my arms. I was like, I've not seen you forever. And then he patted here and he says, so you put on a couple pounds. And I said, I have. Um, I've put on about 27 pounds since January, and I blame it on sourdough. Um, I had this thing uh, uh, during Christmas break uh, that I was like, I'm going to figure out how to bake sourdough bread. And um, I have a s sister who's 36, and she's back home in Ohio. I'm from Ohio. And, and she is a, a like, part-time professional baker. And so she, she has perfected the art of sourdough. And so over Christmas break, I told her, I said, Claire, it's time to teach me how to do sourdough so I can do sourdough here. And I want to do sourdough exactly like you do sourdough. And she said, I can't just tell you how to do sourdough. And I'm going to have to show you. I said, just tell me the formula. And she said, you just can't tell you the formula. All sourdough is the same, but they're all different. And she was telling me how, how sourdough, every loaf of sourdough is just a flour, salt, water, and starter. It's all the same, the same components. And even the proportions are all the same proportions. Um, but the, the key component is the starter to the sourdough and how you take care of your st st starter, depending on who you are, it takes on its own personality. And so since January, I've been on the sourdough, I bake all the time, 27 pounds. And, um, and so I've been baking sourdough. And early on, uh, uh, it's been hard. It has been a, a hard path trying to figure out the sourdough thing because you would bake bread, you pour your heart out into it, and it doesn't do the thing it's supposed to do. And I'm taking pictures of the bread and I'm sending it to Claire and I'm like, tell me what I'm doing wrong. And she was like, tell me, uh, send me pictures from your starter that you're doing. And so I'm taking pictures of the starter every morning. And she says, I don't know. I just have to see it. I need to be there. I need to, but then she did take off the top and tell me what it smells like. And I'm trying to describe what it smells like. And she said, put your finger and tell, the, tell me the consistency. Is it gooey? Is it floury? Is it? And, and I'm like, Claire, I don't know. And she says, I just need to be there. I'm like, Claire, just tell me how to do it. And she says, and she always says, sourdough isn't a science, it's poetry. She's my sister. And so it's, KJ, it's not science, it's poetry. And I bring that up because we are in a book of Psalms for the summer. And Psalms is not science, it's poetry. And, and there's a lot about the book of Psalms that it isn't a here's how to do something, but it's a here's how to experience something. It's you need, to, you need to touch it, you need to smell it, you need to taste it. I don't know. It's not a science. It's poetry. There is not a formula of how to experience psalms, but there is a way that psalms can experience you and vice versa, a good poem. You think about what poetry is versus the thing that science is. Like science can tell you why the sky is blue and why the grass is green. Science can tell you about the bones in your body, but science can't tell you what it feels like to experience joy or hope or sadness. Uh, science can't tell you about the things you feel inside of the human heart. 
That's where poetry comes in crashing really hard. And that's what the Bible brings. The Bible speaks the vocabulary of the human heart so you're able to say, oh, I'm seen. The Bible speaks the vocabulary of the human soul. It's like a good song. Those songs that you hear, that, that when you hear them, you go, I know exactly what that person is singing about because that, that, that comes from the depth of their soul and it connects to who I am too. Uh, King David, who, who authors a ton of the book of Psalms, he is doing that. He is speaking the vocabulary of poetry to inspire and connect to the human heart. He's offering of himself. He isn't giving us science. He isn't giving us theology. He is not giving us a how-to, but he is tearing open his chest and saying, here's my heart. And if you have a heart too, the two of us have something in common. So there's something really beautiful to be able to spend a whole summer in the book of Psalms, especially if you can, can hold on to and explore what it really is because it's so much better than a how-to. Sourdough is not science, it's poetry. And there's a lot about sourdough and bread that has to do with the body of Christ. There's going to be a theme throughout, so hold on to that. So the book of Psalms is composed by King David. Um, there is something very important about understanding who the author is to understand the product of something. Uh, so for instance, I took, I took my wife to a concert the other day. And this concert is this band that I was very, very, very excited about. They've been on this priority list for a long time. And finally, they're coming to Denver, and we had the opportunity to go. And I was trying to tell her about the songs, and I was telling her uh, about some of the history, and I was trying to, but I just couldn't do it justice. And so there the two of us are, and this place is packed out, and this guy comes out, and he can barely talk and he can barely sing and he's telling he's he's trying his best to perform but he's old he's 72 and he's trying to sing the songs that he sung a long time ago and as he is talking and as he is singing and as he is performing this is a sold out audience everyone in there is going wow it's got goosebumps because I, I was there in that spot. Wow, we are so lucky to be here. We are so blessed to be in this space to hear this guy sing. At the same time, Brooke is here going, yikes. Right? Like, yikes. This isn't my favorite concert, she says. And so going home, she's like, I just don't get it. And I was like, man, Brooke, if, if you only knew who this guy was, like his, this band was born in 78. They are the grandfathers of punk rock. They, they started movements. He saw things that like, I mean, just like, and he just got, he, he's been, he has, he's had cancer in his throat for 10 years and he just got healed and he sang you songs, right? All of a sudden that concert was, wow, I can't believe I got to experience that. So the same thing with the book of Psalms. You're able to approach Psalms in, in Psalm 139 and go, wow, that's pretty cool. That's a great, hopeful, beautiful Psalm. But if you knew the author of that Psalm, wow. Wow. So King David, who is David? He was a shepherd boy born in Bethlehem. Shepherd boy born in Bethlehem. First of all, I just want to just, just circle shepherd boy born in Bethlehem. And the first introduction you have of David is he is tending to his flocks and his brothers, his, his, his seven brothers, they are being checked out by a prophet, Samuel, who's trying to find the upcoming king. And David is out in the fields tending to his sheep. Pause button. 
in the season of Advent, pastors always talk about, hey, isn't it super cool that the angels came to the shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem first before they came to anyone else? How come they did that? I don't know. So David, shepherd boy, Bethlehem, fields, brothers to be king. They're, Samuel is trying to find the king. And David's out in the field. I don't know. Go figure it out. There's something there. All right. So, so his, his father, who knew Samuel was coming, he didn't even bother to get David because he didn't qualify. And he brought his brothers out. And Samuel said, nope, there's someone else here. And then they brought David out and said, are you sure? So from the beginning, he wasn't anyone special. Even his father didn't think he was special. Then he was anointed the up-and-coming king by Samuel. After that, there's time that passed, and David found himself fighting against a Philistine giant whose name was Goliath. And he had courage and faith, and he threw a stone from a sling and impaled him right in the head, and he fell over dead, and the favor of God was apparent that it was upon him, and he, all of Israel celebrated behind him. He began to become someone. Saul invited him into his court. He was the up-and-coming king. Plus, he had the favor of God. Plus, Israel loved him. Plus, um, Saul brought him in close because he could play the harp. There was a shepherd boy who could play the harp, born to Bethlehem, and when he played the harp, it calmed Saul's soul. He was a poet, and he also killed a giant, and he was also a shepherd. This guy's incredible. But Saul became very jealous of David and wanted to kill him, although David and Saul's uh, son were best friends, and D David had to hurry off and flee because the armies of Saul were trying to kill him. Okay, I'm pointing out all these things because if this happened to anybody, it would bother you. It would bother you that you don't have the support of your father, right? I'm unseen by my dad, right? Um, it would bother you that she would have to go to b b battle on behalf of a country and, and you are just a boy and their whole army is behind you and you had to have the courage that the other armies do not. Secondly, it would bother you that the king of a country is trying to kill you and is killing other people on your behalf to get to you. Okay, that, that, that whole thing happened. So eventually over time, Saul dies and David becomes king. And David becomes king. He becomes a great politician. He brings the Ark of the Covenant into the center of Jerusalem. He establishes the holy places. Things are awesome. And then he, he falls in. And to sin, he goes to battle. He does all these incredible, crazy, hurtful, harmful, holy, beautiful things. Any one of these things, if they would have happened to us, would have driven us insane, right? They are the things that would put us on the couch and they would cause us to never get up again. But somehow, David had this thing that caused him to keep going through all the horrible experiences that he had. Whenever David sang and danced, the earth shook, poetically speaking, because there was substance behind it. There just wasn't happiness and joy. There was blood on his hands. His chest was torn open. There was like he was dripping in blood. And when he danced, the earth shook because there was a substance in his heart that was weighty. So for someone like David to compose a psalm about the proximity of God is a really potent, beautiful thing. And you can't possibly say, yeah, but I had it harder than him. There is no one I know who has had it harder than him. There's something about Psalm 139, and I promise we're going to get there, that is all about the proximity of God. And proximity is something that people are taught about from an early age. Think about it. Sesame Street. I grew up playing Sesame Street all the time. There's this character on Sesame Street who talks about proximity. 
Why? I don't know. Apparently, it's important to people that he would come very close to the screen and he'd go near. And then he'd go back and he'd go far. And then he'd hurry up near. Far. Near. Far. And it would go faster, faster, faster. And I'd be cheering out near, far, near. As if Sesame Street spent lots of money on this skit so that kids could understand the idea of near and far. And it seems very simple, and it is really simple, and it's ingrained in us because in the church, you are taught very early inside of your heart that there are things that cause God to be very near and that there are things that cause God to be very far. And our desire is to be very near to him, but oftentimes it feels like he's very far from us. That there's this proximity. And, and, and probably all of you are like, no, no, that's not true. It's, 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 but, but, but if you close your eyes, if you just close your eyes and you think, when is a time that I have felt like God was so far away? I'm pretty sure that she, you <coughs> are probably going to be able to think of a time. <coughs> if you think about a time that you felt like God is absent. <coughs> think about a time that you have d- done something that it felt like God turned his back on you. <coughs> think about something that you could p- possibly do that creates a fear inside your heart that God would be so disappointed that he won't ever come back again. Think about those times that, that, that you have felt a great distance between you and God and you don't know how to get it back. Thank you, Mariana. So as I had my eyes closed, I was actually hoping that she would bring me water. And she did. Thank you. Psalm 139 says, the idea of distance between you and God, the idea of a separation between you and God, this idea that that, that there is distance, this idea that there is disappointment, this idea that there is shame, this idea that there is something that you can do is simply untrue. And so that's going to be our experience for today. So here's how Psalm 139, 39, begin. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for for me, too lofty for me to obtain. So think about this. Picture King David sitting down and composing this psalm. And this is one of the few psalms um, that was intended to be sung by a choir, And he's writing this out, and he says, you have searched me, and you know me. Right from the beginning, there's a human desire to be seen, and to be explored, and to be known, and to be approved of. And David puts this out there. God, you have searched me, and you know me. So there was this time in the eighth grade the first time I remember thinking I have insides. This sounds disgusting because it is. I remember being in the eighth grade biology class and I was dissecting a frog and I cut down the center of the frog and I opened it up like a tiny little door and the smell of formaldehyde came up and I said, oh gosh, And then I 
took the open flaps from the frog and I pinned them open. And then I thought, that's me inside. I have the same thing. I have the lungs. I have the intestines. I have a heart. And that frog's dead. And I remember in that time thinking, I have insights. I'm similar to this frog. I, I could be like this frog. It's not breathing. It is dead. I am breathing. What happened to this frog? And I started to contemplate the journey of this frog, the insides of the frog. And as I began to pull out the different things I was supposed to, I felt really bad for the frog because I was pretending of being searched and dissected myself. And it seemed really vulnerable, like the frog didn't ask for this. He didn't sign a form. He didn't say it was okay to go through his body cavity. And here I was in the eighth grade, standing next to Brianna. <laughs> anyway, um, thinking, this seems intrusive. There is something about this psalm that David gives the invitation and celebrates this intrusive act by God. But it's an act that all of us desire to have. This act of being searched and known and being approved of. Because a lot of us think if we are searched and we are known, that God is going to shake his head despairingly, that you are such an utter failure. But David, who is celebrating the fact that he has been searched, his heart, his soul, his anxieties, his comings and his goings. And there isn't anything that he has done that God hasn't already known. There isn't anything that he's doing that God has not been a part of. And there isn't anything he's about to do that God doesn't already know. God completes David's sandwiches. Do you know what I mean? Like there is this, this type of like, God is there in the beginning, he's here now, and he's there after, and he already has you figured out, and he goes, yes. And David somehow is in such close proximity to God that he almost says, man, it just seems whatever I do, you're smiling at me. I don't get it. Why are you always smiling at me? Right? There's something, everything I do, everywhere I go, everything, the ups and downs, you are right there. And wow, you know me. That there is something at the core of our heart that just wants to be known. And David sings songs about God knowing the depths of his soul. All right, the psalm continues. Here it is. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. Uh, that's the best concert ever. <laughs> what? What is that? What is David doing here? What is David saying? First of all, you have seen all of me. You know me. You continue to smile upon me even though you know the depths of my soul. You're a step ahead of me. You're a step behind me. You hem me in. And then he says, where can I go that your spirit is not? David is getting playful, okay? He's getting playful. He's getting challenging. Hard the poet, right? Um, playful, challenging, where can I go that you are not? If I go all the way on the other side of the earth, well, you're there. If I go to the depths of the sea, there you are. If I, if I take a spaceship to, to Saturn, I'd be surprised to find you there too. 
if I could somehow jam myself in a tiny pickle jar. There you are. The darkness is as light to you. I could go in the deepest, darkest cave that it could be, be handcrafted by Satan himself. And somehow you light it up and turn it into Christmas. How did you do that? I could try hard to escape your presence, but it's a futile task. I can't run from you because you seem to be attached to me and I'm attached to you. This is a silly game you and I play. That's what I interpret this as being. This is the heart of David and just saying, man, we've been through a lot together and I have done some serious junk. And you knew it. You were there. And you still smile at me. Why are we doing this? How are you? What's going on? This, this heart of David, everything. I could go in the darkest pits of hell and somehow you greet me there and throw me a celebration. Think about the story of David. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There's this idea that, that, that God and David has, have been up through a lot together, and it seems there's been protection and grace and hope, and they've sat together in sorrow and, and guilt, and they've, they've been through it together. It's like God knows David's heart and David is continually offering it to God because they are in close proximity. If the Sesame Street character were alive in the times of David, he'd get fired because all he would say is near, near, near. And that would just be a really boring skit. David blows the idea of proximity of near and far and spirituality and theology out of the water. And he says, man, there is something about being a child of God that he is always right here. And it's a really beautiful, compelling, awesome gift to be a child of God. The psalm doesn't end here. It continues. There it is. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well, that my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw, me, saw my own unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Okay, Everyone talks about this passage. And there's a phrase in here that I just thought, I always take this for granted. It's this idea of knitting. Okay, like I just typically see some old person who has yarn who's going, right? And they're doing a scarf or something. So I spent some time talking to people about what it is to actually knit. And I've been talking to people who are actually passionate about it because there are people that are passionate about knitting compared to crocheting. In fact, some of the people who knit are not fans of crocheting, and some people who, who do the crocheting aren't fans of the people who do the knitting. But if they ever fought each other, I would buy tickets to that. So, so here's the thing about knitting. It, 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 I just want to share some of the things that I was taught. That it is a creative process. I just thought someone would have a 
pattern and they follow the pattern. In fact, in the origins, there wouldn't actually be a pattern at all. And they would see it as a problem-solving process and in solving the problems to create a, a sweater, a scarf, a hat, a blanket, that they would just begin and go for it. And they would try to outdo the other people that were doing the same thing as them. Um, also, the idea of hitting, it takes fine motor skills to do it. I always picture God having huge hands. And so the idea of him... He doesn't have, I don't know. Anyway, so he is intentionally fine-tuning things, creative process. Also, it is calming and meditative for the people who do it. They enjoy it. This sounds simple, but this is poetry. So David is taking something that is a creative problem-solving process that they take pride in and that it is something that they enjoy and, and it brings them peace to do it. And this idea that God took David and, and, and began to knit him together in this problem-solving process, knowing before David was born, his entire story that was taking place because God was envisioning it and he was causing it all to happen and he felt peace during the whole time it was happening. God knew the whole story of David before it happened and he was at peace, experiencing comfort, and he enjoyed it. There's something really cool in that on top of the idea of man. God built him. God built us. God was intentionally creative, possibly competitive. He celebrated the process in knowing our whole st st story. And our stories don't surprise him. He isn't scared of us. He isn't scared of the things you're going to do because he knows and this brings comfort to David, and it even brings him joy. He celebrates it as if he is going to experience each day when God is greeting him at the foot of his bed saying, it's time to do this again. This is a really close proximity, near, near, near. There is no far. There is no far. Near, near, near. You know my heart. You have built me, knitted me together. Intentionality poured into me, and you just see me and walk alongside me. This is very good for those of us who feel a huge separation between us and God. Those of us who don't see, feel seen by God. Those of us who feel like God doesn't know us at all. David is calling back to us and saying, this is untrue. In fact, there is nowhere you can go. He made you. He knew it all. You are playing a silly game, people. God is right here, very near. Because of this confidence, because of this place that David's heart is, it brings him to this place of brutal honesty. The passage continues. Here it is. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty, they speak of you with evil intent. Your, advers your adversaries, adversary, misuse your name. Do, do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? I abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. All right, so this idea of close proximity to God and God knows his heart, knows his thoughts. He's there as soon as he gets up. He can't escape God. And so David brings, brings his heart and he says, God, I, I hate people. There are some people, the people who hate you, I hate them. Could you just wipe them out, right? He's being vulnerable. 
And then in the same breath, in the same paragraph, in the same thought process, he says, search me and know me. All right? So these things are going together in the same pentameter. So this idea that David is offering his heart, saying, destroy my enemies and search me and know me. But I thought he already said that God has searched him and does know him. But there seems to be this ongoing process that happens. The psalm begins, you have searched me, you know me. And then it ends in the same, search me and know me. As if this is the thing that they interact in, is this idea of being searched and known and seen. Because David is bringing his heart about this chaos, his fears, his anxieties, the, those who oppose him. I have this squirrel at the house that was driving me absolutely crazy because it's been burrowing a hole. It's been bur burrowing a hole under the house and it crawls under there. I will fill the hole and then he'll dig a hole by it. And I have put these things to shut the holes and it has like bent them and it goes right through them. I, I, have, I have done so many things about this squirrel that I actually hate it. I, I am all about animals. I am a friend of the animals. Um, but there's a squirrel who is my enemy because it drives me nuts. It has had babies under my house. I can hear them and I cannot sleep. It drives me insane. I have prayed to God for help. So I have bought squirrel repellent and I have thrown it under the house. I've thrown it in the holes. The other day I come and I see the squirrel carrying the squirrel repellent out and it was eating it. Okay, here's the end of my story. It's going to be super fast. So, so the whole summer, this squirrel has been driving me insane. And I, I hate coming to that spot. It, it, there are other problems that are bigger than this. I get it. But the place that brought my heart, I wanted to destroy the squirrel. I'm sitting there, and I can see the place that it all happens. I'm just sitting there. I'm staring out. I can hear the squirrel under me. It runs out of the hole and it turns and it just like stared at me. And in that moment, I was so mad. It was like, it knows me and I know him and I can't do anything about this guy. And if I do anything, it's coming from an evil place. Like, I have been seen by God and called evil in my heart from that. And so I was like, oh, God, just help. I kid you not, kid you not. 0. 0.2 seconds after I said help, a hawk swoops down, grabs a swirl, and it flew off. And it was like, shoo. And I, 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 I was by myself. But even though I was by myself, I turned like, did you guys see that? Because like that was like the best thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I felt like this is what David talks about. Like destroy my enemies, kill them out. And it's like, and then I felt bad for the squirrel. Um, it, it, I don't know. I, I don't know if God did, did that. Probably not. It was just happenstance. I don't know, maybe. But I experienced some poetry there that was such a gift. Because it brought my heart to this place of calling out. <laughs> God, I can't do anything about this. Can you? If you, maybe, maybe. Can you do this? I think it's cool that in the same breath that, that, that King David is calling out, man, if you can destroy my enemies, that would be awesome. However, search me. Search me, explore my heart, know me. Because the odds are the place I'm at I need to be searched again. The anxieties I have have to be searched again. The fears I had, God come closer to me. God come into me. God know me. The psalm begins, you have, you have searched. The psalm ends, let's do it again. 
There's this idea of proximity, and this, there's this idea of health, and there's this idea of understanding the thing you're talking about. I tried until April to figure out sourdough, and I kept doing the same things, and I kept taking pictures of bread every morning and sending it to my sister, and she's like, I don't know what to tell you. And she's like, tell me about your st st starter again. She and I in the past didn't talk a lot, but then sourdough happened. And she and I are talking every day. And so, so I said, okay, Claire, here's what I do. And I'm, I'm kind of angry. I'm the older br brother, right? So I do the hands. Okay, Claire, here's what I do. I have my sourdough starter. I pull it out of the fridge. I, I pull it out of the fridge. I take the sourdough starter. I put it in the pan. And but then I mix the water. And then I blah, blah, blah. And she goes, wait, wait, wait. So you take the sourdough starter from the fridge. And then you put it in your, uh, uh, your dough ball. I'm like, yeah. Because I don't want the sourdough starter to expire out on the counter. And she goes, KJ, you idiot. And she, she says the whole thing about sourdough, uh, the, the starter, you have to keep it at room temperature so the bacteria can grow and be vibrant and you feed it every day. And I said, I know, but I thought if I could keep it in the refrigerator, then I don't have to feed it that often. Uh, I'm crying talking about sourdough starter. Um, I don't have to feed it that, option, that often. I can just feed it after I pour some out and I can just put it back in because it's slows everything down and puts it to sleep until I pull it out again. And she says, no, you have to keep it on your counter and you have to feed it several times before you can even think about putting it in your dough ball. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I started, I, I started to cultivate my sourdough starter, right? And it became bubbly and smells terrible and amazing. And then, then like the consistency, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I get it. And, and then I started to bake bread, and I'm like, I'm like sending Claire pictures and videos. I remember I showed Claire a video of the bread that was crackling after I pulled it out of the oven. And I'm like, Claire, it's never crackled before after the oven. And she said, I know that's the sourdough song. And she's like, I'm so proud of you. And I was crying and I was like, I did it. Hold on, here's the point. We are people who have forgotten to cultivate our hearts, um, have forgotten to feed our hearts, who have forgotten that it, belongs doing things in the presence of God, being fed by him, being handheld by him, being seen and explored, the text is, the, 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 the smell, because we're consistently putting our hearts in the fridge out of fear of it being exposed or expiring, and we just want it to sleep and be cold until we have to pull it out to go to church on Saturday or Sunday, and then here it is, and then we're like, how come our bread isn't that great? How come our spiritual lives are just, eh? Because your heart hasn't been fed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You have not been experiencing. We have not been cultivating this healthy heartbeat thing of the proximity of you and God. And when the church comes together with people who have been in God's proximity every day and he knows you and you know him. I want to be with you, right? So, so all of a sudden, this handshaking time at the beginning, 30 seconds just doesn't hack it for me because I want to know what you and God have been up to. The idea that the heart cultivated and fed by God on a, you get up and there he is. You go to bed and he's going, have a good sleep, buddy. And then all during the night, he's right there on your bedside and you know it because there's not a place that you can go that he is not. There's not something that you can do. In fact, the more you sin, the odds are he gets just closer up in your business. The idea of spirituality is not an outside job. It's an inside job. It's not a science. It's, not, it's poetry, and God speaks really great poetry because he knitted your heart together. He wove it in there. He knows it. And he's excited for you to see his creation of you. So for those of you who have felt as if God is so far away, away.
He's not. For those of you who feel like he doesn't see you, he does. For those of you who are anxious about the things you have done or the things you're planning on doing or what you could possibly do, he's not afraid. In fact, he takes great peace in you and the things he's done inside of you. So it could be an incredible practice for you to simply see the puppet on Sesame Street and just picture him saying, near, 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 or the frog on the formaldehyde thing being sealed up and jumping off the thing because the breath is in him. Or this idea of the sourdough, or the idea possibly of saying, God, you have searched and you know me, but let's keep doing this because our thing is an inside job and you know me better than I know myself. Because this is the thing that I believe that kept David in the place that he had been and experiencing joy in the center of darkness, eating at a table that was, that, that was in the presence of his enemies, being able to sleep in green pastures as bombs exploded all around him. The presence of God and the proximity of God brought David this idea of peace, identity, hope, love, and joy to the point that whenever Jesus was born, that the, the angels from heaven sang to the shepherds to kind of tie this whole idea up together that, that God is with us, Emmanuel. That is the name of God that King David began to proclaim back in Psalm 139. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for the spaces that you create for us to experience you. And thank you for coming into the spots that have been created by us for you to enjoy. God, in this place, in this place, the Psalms of David brings up this truth that you search us and you know us. It is something that you have done. And then the end of the psalm presents this idea of an invitation that each of us can ask. Lord, search us and know us. God, search me, know me. For some of us, how that phrase is said is very different. Some of us can say this phrase in confidence. God, search us and know us. Some of us, this phrase is out of fear. God, search me and know me. Some of us can say this phrase and be unsure. God, search me and know me. For some of us, it feels like calling out in the void and it seems to echo. Lord, hear our prayer. In this space, wherever you are and whatever you have brought, brought to this place and whatever has brought you to this place, I want you from whatever heartbeat that you find yourself in to ask the question or give permission to God, Lord, search me and know me. Tell me what you see. This upcoming space and this upcoming time is simply for you. It's for you to sit in the presence of God. He's prepared this for you. He gave that invitation for you to speak. Lord, search me and know me. And whatever happens from here on is up to you. Hey, wherever you're at coming out of this message, because this is kind of 
a tricky topic right, and everything. Right. Um, we would love to have conversations with you or pray with you if you need that. Um, you can head over to our website. There's a chat button in the lower right-hand corner, and we always have somebody there um, that would love to connect with you, answer any questions you have, um, or just have a conversation. We hope you guys have a great rest of your day.